All right. Good morning, Doug. Today, I want to talk about a very controversial topic, something that happened a couple of days ago, and that is the, the conclusion of the Derek Chauvin trial, where he was found guilty on all three counts, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, murdering in uh, second degree, I think was the most severe uh, version of it, George Floyd. What do you think about that whole situation? Well, so many questions arise. The uh, first thing that popped into my mind is, uh, wait a minute, how can you be guilty of second degree, third degree murder, and also manslaughter? I mean, isn't it kind of an either or type of situation? And do you have to, if you're convicted of all three, does that mean you have to serve overlapping sentences for the three of them? I, I mean, I, look, I, I'm, I'm not a... I'm not wired in a legalistic way. So it's a mystery to me. I'm sure some lawyer could explain the logic of it, but I don't know what it is. First thing, triviality, but a question. Yep, and it, and it does seem, and I think that is the that is a weird thing. And I think I remember reading some uh, legal analysis from somebody who does know a lot about this, um, who talks to Charles closely, saying that, um, you know, that just the second degree murder charge was just, you know, there's just no zero basis for it. And it was, it was clearly not proved beyond a reasonable doubt, you know, during the case. And, um, but of course that didn't stop the, the jury from, from, uh, um, you know, finding him guilty of that charge. So, you know, what I worry about with all of this is that the, um, I mean, there's, I'm I actually, I'm confused about this whole thing. Cause I have, I'm of two minds, you know, and in one case I want, I think equal treatment, under the law is the basis of any civil society. Without that, really, you've got nothing. And um, so I think that's super critically important. And it's, it's, it's uh, easy to argue that that didn't occur completely in this case. On the other side, you see all these terrible things happening to people, um, you know, the lockdowns, uh, um, you know, lots of, uh, anyway, all the, gov all the bad ideas from the government require these enforcers, these police in order to, to make sure they happen. And they seem to be eager to participate in this, uh, you know, in the, the dampening of civil liberties in America. So I'm not, even though my dad's a cop, I'm, you know, I, I become more anti-police. Well, I completely agree with you uh, because I'm, I'm not a friend of the police per se. There's several reasons I say that. First of all, uh, a lot of cops, maybe most cops, uh, have an extra Y chromosome. Uh, they tend to be much more aggressive than the average person. That's like uh, with dogs. They're like German shepherds or Rottweilers uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, Labradors or poodles. So, um, yeah, I, I'm suspicious of police. I mean, I'm suspicious of anybody, quite frankly, that likes beyond a certain age, walking around in a uniform and carrying a gun when nobody else has one. I mean, I think it's great to carry a gun. Nothing wrong with walking around in a uniform, but you know, beyond a certain age, it's kind of unseemly, uh, I, I think, to, to do that and to, to sport a badge and that. Uh, I'm, I'm very suspicious of them. And uh, like I say, Cops aren't necessarily good people. You know, they're necessarily kind of aggressive people. And we often get the wrong impression from watching cop shows on TV, which dominate television, where they're all honest and thoughtful and kind and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I've known a lot of cops in my life and uh, uh, no, that's not generally the case. Yeah, and I think it's uh, what my my dad would say is that, you know, he's retired now, but he said that he, he even 20 years ago, I remember him telling me that he was concerned about the new generation of of uh, police officers, just that they had it was a they had a different attitude, you know, it was a um, the policing a change from being a peace peace officer to law enforcement, you know, rather than just making sure that people are going along and getting along and trying to, you know, keep the peace. They were trying to bust people. You know, they're trying to like find infractions and to penalize people. And and he said that change really bothered him. Uh, and he, you know, it, it was it seemed like a generational thing at, uh, to him at the time. Well, that's a that's an excellent point. And 
And I can see how that could happen because um, in the last few decades, the police have um, recruited heavily uh, among the military. And, um, and in recent decades, the military have been involved in all kinds of sketchy illegal wars in third world countries where it's really an us against them type of thing. And it's bad enough if you're just a cop anyway, uh, you're kind of set aside and it's kind of us against them. But I think that's aggravated it. The fact there are so many ex-military that have been in, in sketchy third world combat zones uh, that take uh, the point of view of uh, military police or an occupying force as opposed to peacekeepers, as you said. Exactly. You know what? And you sent you sent an email around uh, to a bunch of your friends the other day that talking about these new uh, measures that were being rolled out in Ontario, where they're, you know, they're basically there's checkpoints and you have you can't you can't be out after curfew without a really good excuse, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, some one of the one of the friends said that they heard that uh, you know one of the local police chiefs had said to the you know to the government officials that you know we're not going to enforce this but of course you know that person was anonymous to you know they they would not do that in public they would only do it behind closed doors and and uh you know that really when i read that when i read that about this 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 police chief supposedly saying you know no we're not going to violate people's rights but not being willing to do it in public it just made me think you know these guys are the problem because if these guys if they if they really feel that way you know, they could, they could, they should say it publicly. They should say, you know, we're against this. This is wrong. We're not going to enforce it. That's just the way it is. And it also in the U S at least, maybe the teachers union is the most powerful union in the country, maybe, but the police union has got to be number two. If the, if not number one, they, I mean, cops don't, it's hard to fire a cop, really hard to fire a cop. Um, you know, and so if they decided as a unit, you know, that they were going to do something or not doing something, I mean, there's nothing that the the government officials could do. I mean, they would just have to go along. They'd have to bend to the will of the police. I think ultimately. So that's. It just seems like I'm just looking for the place where we might find some courage in our, uh, you know, in the citizens that have a, have the opportunity to make a difference. And it, the police would be that front line, you would think, but you don't see it at all. You don't see it in mass anyway, in, in public declarations. Instead, you just see them lining up to protect government buildings as the rest of the city is burned down and looted. Yeah, and it's a fact, I think, that uh, cops tend to hang out with and socialize with and be friends with other cops, mostly. I mean, um, I, don't, I don't know how many, is that true of lawyers and doctors? Not, I don't think so to the same degree at all, or teachers, I don't think that's the case, really. They're, you know, it's just an occupation, and, but cops tend to hang with other cops. And... That's true. It's like a brotherhood. I mean, that's what they would consider it. It's it's a, it's it's much like your you know your squad or your uh, your platoon in the army. I mean, these are your these are your brothers. You know, it's 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 your number one goal is to keep them safe. You know, and to protect each other. Yeah, yeah. I've said for a long time that the uh, when it comes to the. Uh, police or the military for that matter, that their first obligation uh, is to their comrades, their second obligation is to their employer, and number three are the people that they're supposed to preserve and protect. And that's perfectly normal and natural. That's the way groups work. So it's not like an evil conspiracy. It's that's actually just human nature. That's the way it is. So, but it's potentially dangerous. Uh, but like you were saying earlier, this thing with uh, Chauvin being a railroader, and it's clear that he was. I mean, first of all, it appears that the guy really is an asshole, and I I know nothing about him uh, other than other than what I've seen or heard recently, nothing at all. But it's it's simply unacceptable to keep your uh, knee on somebody's neck for nine minutes, especially when this person was clearly you know, troubled and handcuffed 
and you got four other cops around you and you know that's that, that's actually inexcusable to to do something like that 100 percent. i felt the same way when i saw the video like every i actually i thought that that video was probably uh, a uniting moment for the country in many ways. Like where I, I don't think that everyone was on the same page about something being wrong uh, since 9-11. You know, when, 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 when we saw, the, you know, the, the buildings fall or whatever, everyone's like, this is, this is a problem and something must be done. And I think that yeah. most people felt the same way about when they saw George Floyd, despite his many character flaws or whatever, uh, uh, they saw the situation happen. They're like, this is unacceptable. Like, this should not happen. This, this kind of situation should not no, occur. No, there's no excuse for it. I mean, sure. I mean, it seems pretty clear that Floyd was a thug and a career criminal. And, you know, at the time he was acting goofy and high and so forth. But he was fully under control. And Well, well to start with, he, he, the, he shouldn't have been busted. Uh, the way he was for passing a $20 bill. This is more along the lines of uh, somebody used, trying to use a stolen credit card at a store. I mean, that's uh, obviously a felony, but not the type of thing that you get into a potentially deadly situation right. with like that. It, to me, it's a good argument for the police not being canceled, but to the greatest extent possible being privatized instead of being instruments of the state having to enforce thousands of stupid, meaningless laws, uh, they should basically just be uh, uh, private, enforcing only laws against, uh, well, uh, violations of personal property or uh, or, or, or your physical safety. Not right. all these, uh, like drug laws. There shouldn't be any drug laws. Of course. Yeah, and, and it's, and just the, the tendency for, uh, for es to, this goes, I, I guess, back to the law enforcement versus peace officer argument. You know, if they would have approached the situation as peace officers rather than law enforcement, there's just the, the probability of it escalating in the way that it did is almost non-existent, I think. I just, I just, just wouldn't happen if you're trying to find a peaceful resolution uh, to to a situation or trying to, you know, uh, de-escalate. Instead, they go to escalation first. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in this in this case, not that Floyd wasn't hadn't proven himself completely capable of uh, all kinds of felonies and assaults in the past, but in this case, uh, apparently he wasn't assaulting or threatening anybody. Uh, so. The, the police really ramped this thing up. But what, and of course, they're going to be trying these other four, I guess, officers that were around there. I wonder what's going to happen to them, because it seems to me that the jury was intimidated here. Everybody knew who the jury was. And uh, if uh, Chauvin had gotten off too lightly, I mean, who knows? They might have had their houses burned or been assaulted themselves. And, Right. Couldn't, couldn't count on the police to protect them at this point. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's, it's, you know, we basically spent the first however long this has been totally crapping on the police. But on the other, there's a whole other side to this, which is just simply that, you know, is there, you know, is there equal protection under the law? You know, can you have to have a, you know, can a situation where uh, you're not really receiving a fair jury trial be considered justice at all? Uh, I mean, you got to look at the situation and go like why it wasn't moved to a different jurisdiction. I don't know. It just seems like that would be a no brainer. It seems like this has to be moved somewhere else, you know, in a place and not in the same city where it happened. That seems like that's with much lower profile cases that has been the, you know, the default approach. Uh, so it seems like that would have been an obvious one. I agree. And I think I would actually go further in that. Uh, the jury system itself is a good idea for dispensing justice. But I think it could be better if we had professional jurors where the prosecuting authority, whether it's an individual or the state or whoever is bringing charges, doesn't have to be the state in a free market society, and the accused uh, both 
put up uh, an organization or individuals that they both agree are neutral or satisfactory to them and let the professionals decide as opposed to 12 people who are too dumb to get out of jury duty because nobody wants to you know sit under the control of you know for god knows how many days with no income something you have no interest in this is this should be left to professionals that are agreed upon by both parties That's that would be better than the juries as we know them it's a really good point especially in this case i mean these jurors were basically in a position where if you know if they came down with the wrong answer uh the, the wrong answer there i mean there was going to be real pro, real trouble for them real trouble their lives would have been in danger no question about it yeah. and everything else their property their livelihoods no it was it's a no-win situation so this thing ought to be overturned and, and and retried it seems to me especially with uh maxine waters uh, uh, beating the drums for race hatred on the spot mm -hmm. i mean that's rather inappropriate and even though the jury was sequestered uh biden giving his opinion would win i mean the whole thing was rotten for me yeah no doubt about it and i think that there's uh, just for everything is political. And we've talked about this idea before because they've taken this situation and they go, this is not justice. This it really isn't even justice. There is there, but this is an, this is the first step in actually dealing with the real problem. So, you know, when you're, when someone's on trial, it's supposed to be a person who's on trial, not an idea that's on trial. But in this case, it really was an idea. And he was sort of the, uh, you know, the scapegoat idea but the truth is the idea is not not at all uh killed to the extent that uh, the the political parties seem to be interested in driving it so it's just going to get it's it just seems to me that this is uh there's an effort on the part of the leadership in this country and really and every grifter out there to to escalate just to escalate this to use this as an opportunity to to do what they do which is to uh confuse people about what's actually going on and divide people as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, and it's going to breed uh, more race hatred where people start looking at themselves as members of racial groups as opposed to looking at themselves as individuals. Uh, and in this particular case, I wasn't there. I don't know what was going on in the minds of the cops or the bystanders or anybody, but I can't see how it had anything to do with the fact that George Floyd was black. Maybe it, I think it had a lot to do with the fact they probably checked him out and found out he was a career, career criminal, which helped to ramp things up in the cop's eyes, obviously, mm -hmm. but nothing to do with the fact that he's black. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous in my view. Yeah, and I, I know. If, if, you know, I, it does seem to me that the, uh, that the socioeconomic status of people tends to matter more, you know, because if you're in a bad part of town, or a poor part of town where there's more crime anyway, you know, the cops are gonna uh, probably pursue it more aggressively. Uh, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna be more on the defensive essentially from the very beginning than they would if they were in some, you know, wealthy or suburb where they got a call like that. So I think, you know, it's probably has more to do with the, the you know, the economic conditions around them, which tend to feel more crime than it does have to do with the, the race part of it at all. That's total conjecture on my point, but. Well, no, but it's perfectly logical because um, if I'm walking down the street uh, late at night and uh, there's a bunch of young Jews who seem to be coming from a chess club meeting on one side and a bunch of young blacks that look like they're gangsters, uh, I'll tell you which side of the street I'm going to walk down. You know, it's just it's just logical. And the fact is that, you know, blacks commit crimes totally out of proportion to their size in the population. So it's simply normal and natural to, you're playing the law of large numbers. Yeah, chances are better that they're gonna be thugs than a group of white people. Yeah, 
you know, one of the, one of the worst the things, one of the worst things I think is coming from this is I really, like I said, I really think that there's an effort to divide people. So, and and you talked about increasing racial tensions, and you see these these crazy instances of um, young black women crime, like you had the situation with the driver in D.C. the the Uber Eats driver where they I don't know if you saw this video where they you know they um, tried to carjack him with a taser and he was ultimately killed. And um, in that process, it's, yeah. it's grotesque, the whole scene. It is. And, and how, is that, how is that sorted out at this point? Um, so you had a couple of, were they teenagers? These 13 and 15 years old, I believe. Well, that's pretty aggressive for a 13 and a 15 year old. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to tase him and steal his car. That was the deal, I guess, huh? Yep. And then uh, he went out of control and he, and yeah. I got killed. Yep. So what's happened, what's happened to those two? Have they been, you know, released on their own at recognizance or what's the story? Do we know? The last I heard is that they, they made a deal with the prosecutor that would allow them to, uh, you know, be out by the time they're 18 years old, I believe. It was 18 or 21, something like that. But basically they would, you know, be in a youth, uh, whatever, um, facility. And then, uh, and then they'd be released when yeah, after, I think, I think it was eighteen, but it could have been twenty-one. So, but they, yeah, they just settled. Okay. Well, the chances are good that by the time they get out of that youth facility, they're going. They're already. They already seem to be hardened criminals, but they'll definitely be hardened criminals by the time they get out of that, and they'll have cost the public. hundreds of thousands of dollars more to incarcerate them and the family of that Uber driver is totally uncompensated. So he doesn't win. What, what should happen, in my opinion, is that uh, those girls would be adjudicated as, um, would be adjudicated and damages assessed and uh, they'd have to work long enough, even if it winds up that all they can do is sell blood or maybe sell their body parts, uh, who knows? Or maybe be like the Birdman of Alcatraz and educate themselves into some worthwhile occupation so they could pay off their debt. And, you know, so the intelligent thing to do is try to turn it from a, a cost situation into a benefit situation uh, and, and improve the lives of those girls along the way. Right, at least to try and provide some, some restitution of some that situation, and I'll and I'll tell you, and I'll talk about one other one that uh, happened the other day, and um, and that is, that, you know, when the car is overturned and the man, I can't remember the driver who, who was killed, but he's laying there, uh, you know, on the side of the road, clearly dead or seriously injured. It just happened to be a bunch of National Guard troops in that area because of course dc was essentially you know it was you know had ten thousand plus troops around and you know as a former member of the national guard i just looked at that and go don't uh, we all know how to render aid basic first aid is part of the deal everyone knows how to do that that's part of the training and yet they just stand around at, like totally oblivious and i'm like if this is if this is our guard today if this is the military today um it was very disconcerting, you know, that they that they failed to render aid to this clearly injured man. Yeah, exactly. That's just improper. I mean, wh whoever the sergeant or the officer in charge was, they should be uh, demoted, maybe court martial for dereliction of duty. I agree, hundred percent. So the, one of the cases that's things just worth talking about really quickly is that, um, and let me put this in context a little bit. I think that this this encouragement of you know that that uh, that the minority groups are being oppressed. You know that there is uh, justice needs to be found. It it seems like it it's encouraging people to think to behave more recklessly. Um, you know on the you know and so yeah that's where you see these 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 children these girls with this situation with the Uber driver. But there was a situation also I believe it was in Ohio a couple of days ago where a police officer uh, was called at, because there was a an active altercation, a fight happening between um, 
you know, some young black girls. And I think there were some, some other uh, black males involved as well. And the police officer shows up, sees yeah. one of the women run after another one. She's brandishing a knife. It looks like she's moving in to even to stab her. And the, the officer shoots that girl who's 15 years old. And it just seems like this escalation of violence, and maybe it's always been that way. We just we're getting more, just getting more attention now. But this escalation of violence among these young, these girls. I mean, I have children their age. It's just crazy to me to see this. Yeah, it's especially unusual to see this among girls. I mean, um, yeah, that's somewhat unusual. Girls. And I saw the picture of this person that was shot. And uh, this woman, I if I if I had to pick her, eyes of a buffalo. And when somebody hadn't she already stabbed somebody who was on the ground? Uh, I'd, she gone after them. I'm not sure if she actually stabbed them or not, but she definitely had gone after them. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's going to be very hard to get uh, accurate reporting on this because one thing that I did read is I was making a joke to my wife about. Um, I'm sure that girl was an honor student. And the nature of my joke was that um, in Tom Wolfe's book, uh, oh, what was that book he wrote 20 years ago about the masters of the universe in New York? Bonfire of the Vanities. Bonfire of the Vanities, exactly. And um, part, of, part of the thing was that uh, the, uh, the reporter writing it up quizzed the, um, the, uh, the teacher of, of the black kid that got killed or whatever happened to him. And he said, would you say he was a good student? Uh, it was about average. And anyway, he, he extracted uh, enough verbiage to be able to say he was an honor student. Anyway, I thought it was ironic that um, this girl was described as an honor student. Now, what the hell does that mean in this context? An honor student <laughs> looking like that and brandishing a knife and stabbing somebody. Yeah, and her, mo her mother. The whole society is become degraded. Her mother said something like that: her name meant peace and love, and uh, that she was a peaceful child. You know, that she was a peaceful girl. And it's like, well, not at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> was not peace. No. So it, it just shows the, the degradation of the culture, though. And it just seems, again, like that even the fact that that local story reaches national attention, you know, and has become something that both, I mean, you, you and Uruguay have seen, and I here have seen, and most of our viewers have probably seen this video or heard about this case already that just happened a couple of days ago, shows that it's like there's a, there's an escalation, uh, you know, a, almost like advertising these, these differences, you know, advertising the tensions between, you know, the, the, the people in this country. And it, it it's, it's driving wedges and it's going to end badly unless, you know, there's, unless there's some effort to try and lower the tensions. It's just, I just can't see it ending well. Well, talking about lowering the tensions, one thing was that uh, the city uh, had awarded uh, oh, George Floyd's family $27 million before the trial even happened. And that's, the fact that that occurred is prejudicial in itself to the outcome of the trial uh, and, and stupid beside. I, I'm just wondering how much of that was uh, compensatory and how much of it was um, uh, in punishment for, for having, having done this. I mean, that's a huge amount of money to award to the estate of a career criminal. Yeah, it's an enormous amount of money, especially when this there is a active uh, judicial process underway that is going to you know help find theoretically at least some um, objective resolution to the problem. 
you know, it makes more, it makes maybe more sense for them to do it today than it made sense for them to do it while jury selection was happening. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. seems like they're trying to feed tensions, Doug. That's all. That's what it looks like to me. No, there's no question about it. And I'm sympathetic to the fact that yeah, ever since there were slaves, black people in the US and everywhere, frankly, outside of Africa, uh, have gotten a bad deal. I mean, frankly, uh, you know, being a white person, uh, it's never really occurred to me, except when I was walking down the street in the ghetto, when I felt, hmm, I wonder if this is how a black person feels when they're walking down the street in a tough white neighborhood, maybe. So, you know, I can understand the psychology behind this, but these people are, they're, they're really making it worse, these race hustlers. They're, they're really destructive. Yeah, and my, my biggest worry with the whole thing, Doug, is I think that for the most part, um, the, the more uh, aggressive parts of the most aggressive whites have, have basically stood down in all of this. And I think that it's, it's, it just feels like it's designed to, 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 you know, to drive the tensions to such, such an extent that you get a reaction, a real reaction from white people uh, you know, tr that's, that really is abusive of black people and then just all hell breaks loose. I mean, and it just seems like that's what they're trying to create, a situation where that is likely. And then, of course, the next question that comes up is that uh, it seems to be dangerous to be a cop today because the public is generally suspicious of you, or a lot of the public is suspicious of you. But now you can be prosecuted for doing or not doing your job. So I would think that uh, a lot of cops are going to be quitting these days, grab the pension and run. Yeah, we have seen that. We have seen that happening. There have, I, I saw some statistics on that recently about that. And but I think the the, the worst part of that is the uh, you know the the maybe the better cops especially will be stepping down you know from it because you know the, all the whole situation where there's the conflict with the community they don't want any part of that and they don't want you know they see maybe some some bad cops on their side they don't want any part of that and so they they just want to exit they just want to walk away but you would think at some point some of these cops just because would again, because these unions are so strong, you know, because they actually do wield so much authority, I'm shocked that there aren't basically walkouts. Like, I mean, the teachers union is in some cities has refused to teach for a year, refused to teach. And I'm just wondering, like, what, are the cops ever going to do that? And maybe they're only going to do it in the, in the really most weaselly way where they just choose to stay in their squad car and drive around all shift you know, and, uh, but still collect their paycheck and all that instead of actually taking a public stand and saying, Hey, you know, well, you know, we can't, we can't police if we're worried that everything we do is going to be scrutinized. If every time something happens, we're going to, you know, we're going to be thrown in jail. Also, you know, um, the tensions with the community like this, or, or even when, when they're, when they're required to stand down while the city burns, but still, but protect, you know, city hall, like you gotta, you gotta assume some cops are like, are going to be screw this like why is this like i'm here to help people exactly it's got to demoralize the whole force and demoralize the best members of the force in particular and it's a different situation from the teachers quite frankly because uh the teachers may have been doing their students a favor <laughs> by staying away for a year i mean to start with, they're not going to be indoctrinating kids with all kinds of ridiculous false values, number one. And number two, it's going to help devolve actual responsibility on the parents to teach their kids values. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of net positives about that, but it just I was just using that as an example to show the power of these unions and the police unions are just as powerful. So I just don't understand how they're not able to you know, I'm, I'm surprised, I guess, that there's, uh, you know, that there hasn't been a better standing, a public standing up against some of the things that are, um, well, especially the things that vi that encourage them to violate their, their oaths of office, you know, to violate the constitutional rights of their citizens, to not protect citizens when their cities are being burned down, but instead protect, you know, the elected officials or these government buildings or whatever. So, and you know, 
another thought is that it's especially strange that this has been made into a, a red hot race issue when all of the, or most, I should say, not all certainly, of the major cities in this country have black mayors and black chiefs of police. But uh, doesn't that have something to do with it? How does that relate to, to this? If, uh, if, you know, blacks are in control of these major cities, why, you know, this is all rather bizarre. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it is amazing how, uh, I hate to use the word, but like mind control, of the population worked where it's like, you know, don't look behind the curtain, you know, don't ever, don't ever question anything other than the most superficial surface level uh, reason for anything that's happening, you know, don't look behind the curtain. Yeah, and the, and the trend is still in motion and getting worse at an accelerating rate, I'm afraid. I mean, nothing's happened to defuse this yet. And I suspect nothing will happen with the Bolsheviks in command in Washington, DC. I mean, these people are going to continue fanning the flames for, I, I suspect mainly because they suffer from massive psychological aberrations. But uh, gee, we're only a hundred days into Biden's presidency. Can't wait to see what happens. Exactly, I think escalation is the, uh, is the trend and I don't think there's any way around that. So. I think we'll, uh, we can leave it here for now. And tomorrow, um, according to Jeff Berwick, as long as he is not in jail, he will be on the show with us live at, uh, I believe it's 6 p.m. Eastern time for a ANCAP happy hour live stream special. So I'm looking forward to that. And I know you are as well. So have your, have your drink and your cigar ready, Doug. You can, you can plan your life around that, Matt. <laughs> All right. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Doug. Okay, thank you, Matt.